Good afternoon, my friends. Welcome to our Art in Conversation. Ornamentation, a source of feminist art. No one represents this statement better than Joyce Kozlov. Joyce Kozlov was one of the original members of the pattern and decoration movement and was an early artist who involved in feminist art movement. Her long-term passion have been history, culture, decoration, and popular art. Joyce has stated once, decoration humanizes our living and working space. It connects us with Asian worldwide tradition and crafts. Joyce's work are included in many museums, include Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art, Library of Congress, National um, Gallery of Art, and many others. Uh, Joyce, welcome to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, like it's like dream comes true to many of us, include me. I studied Islamic art and I grew up in Islamic culture and design and weave carpet since I was 13 years old and teach, today teaching Islamic art and architecture, Asian Egypt and Mesopotamian art and symbols and many others. So I've been around pattern and symbols all my life. And I should say that the reason I'm able as, as, a, as an artist to, to use pattern and symbols in my art, that would be you. And you are my hero and many of us hero. So thank you and we salute you and we appreciate you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very touched by that. Where did you grow up? I'm from Iran. Uh-huh. Yes. I've been to Iran. Yes. Very interesting. So I'm, I- I tell you, when I, when I went to Isfahan and oh. stood in that great square with the mosques, the tile, oh, wow. I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I just said, it never gets any better than this. I know. And I really, I really made that. It's just the top. Have you saw the art and architecture school right behind the square? Um, yes, I, I, I was with a. Um, it, it was a moment of um, a little bit. It was under Hatami when things were okay. a little cooler between the two countries. And I spoke in a conference in Tehran about art and postmodernism. And yeah. they, they brought us, I said, I won't come unless they, you bring me to Isfahan. And they said, sure. they brought all of us. Yeah. And uh, they, they, took, they took us around to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Does James Russell was there? He was my professor at Harvard. Uh, oh, uh-huh my advisor, because he said he'd been to Iran during Katani with a group of artists and professors. I don't think it was the same group, I would remember. Yeah. But that, that it was a moment of opening. There were a number of events. Yes. And then it closed down again. You know? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, today it's quite difficult to go. So yeah, I mean, I designed carpet um, back then because um, I was from poor family and I made it. So, mm -hmm. and then now I'm like fascinated with symbols, pattern, Asian Egypt and all those things. So this is an opportunity for me to learn mm -hmm. about your work and your passion. These um, images we're, show we're showing are a little later in my career and do not include any Islamic patterning, but that, uh, is something I work with a lot in the 1970s and a so, sometimes in, since. Um, but um, it's kind of where I came in, where I entered, you know? Yeah, so that would be actually my first question for you, and uh, which is as one of the leader of pattern and decoration movement, how and why did this pattern and decoration movement started and how uh, why you became interested in pattern? Uh, in, for you know, me, it was different roots for different members of the group. For me, it was feminism. Absolutely. Um, I began to think about the prejudice against 
uh, the decorative in my education, my, you know, art historical art education, where the worst thing you could say about an artist's work was that it was decorative. And I still hear that to this day. I just heard someone use that term in a pejorative sense a few days ago. Um, and, you know, us feminists were questioning everything at that time. And I'm talking about 1970, uh, when there was this kind of massive uh, cultural feminist movement uh, globally and in this country. Um, and so we were looking at all the reasons for the hierarchies in art and um, the decorative arts were largely the arts that were done by women and, and non-Western people and Western art history uh, prioritized uh, uh, the, the work of uh, uh, of white male painters, of, of uh, uh, basically uh, figurative, religious uh, painting that became abstract painting, uh, but didn't acknowledge the roots of abstraction in, in other traditions and cultures. Um, so we, uh, I remember a moment when with a friend of mine in California, Gila Hirsch, we started looking into the uh, pe prejudice against the decorative. Um, we were looking at, we were, we went through art magazines and we were underlining adjectives that were used for men and women's work. And, you know, tough, strong, virile, those were good things and soft, pretty, feminine, decorative were bad things. So like, what does this word decorative mean? And it, it, it really has this relationship to the decorative arts. Um, and so, of course, that was the decorative arts were not part of my education. I was educated in the Western high art tradition, but I became very interested, and so did a number of other women. And so we started looking at things. We started looking for uh, new sources and influences, and um, and and then then instead of worrying so much that we would be uh, maligned for being decorative we decided to embrace it and make our work as decorative so as we possibly could. Yeah, and then why non-Western? I mean, I know you use a lot of different culture and religions, right? Yes, I, I, I've taken from everyone and I've been criticized for that more yeah. and more as, as, as appropriation is now considered a form of um, uh, theft. For me, it was uh, an homage, and I was very surprised. And this first, this this discussion first came about in the '70s. It's not new. Um, the accusation that if one appropriates from other cultures, one's a cultural imperialist, um, and I I was shocked, and I was very ignorant and innocent. And I think that uh, you know, today. Uh, my work has changed and I use things in different ways. But at that time, it was just what you see here, this painting, it was just totally an homage. I had, uh, I had been to Morocco in 1975 and these are kind of all the things that were in my head that I saw, the carpets, the tile work, um, the carved wood, the mishrabiya, the carved wood. And uh, I, for me, I wanted to, the, it's a very long painting, uh, 15 feet. And I did a number of them that I wanted them to be experienced like not all at once, but sequentially like walking through the streets of a, of a city you didn't know. And then you'd see this and then you'd see that and then you'd see the other thing. And then you'd see the, a vista into the landscape maybe, or you'd look into a doorway. Um, so that was the idea. And, and then it just became really, I, I, I moved onto the walls after that and I started doing installations because it was kind of like the paintings were coming off the boundaries of the stretchers. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I see that. I mean, for me, it's familiar because I'm teaching Islamic art and architecture, geometric uh, drawing. Where are and you all teaching things. it? Um, at a school of visual art. Uh -huh. I, uh, before I, I was at Rhode Island School of Design, now I'm at SVA. Also, I taught I'm in both those places, by the way. Myself. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And now I'm also um, being invited to teach at Bard College at present for uh -huh. 
and I'm teaching geometric drawing every Thursday and Fridays and they are to the roof. Wow. <laughs> I'm just so happy they're learning, you know. And uh, yeah, one of the thing actually, I notice in your work, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure you see this book, The Grammar of Ornament, Owen Jones. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I saw a lot. Have you um, inspired by Owen Jones' work? <laughs> because Well, uh, back in the uh, 70s, definitely, we, we looked at that. And we looked at, I looked at a lot of books on Islamic pattern. I have kind of mini library. Yeah. Um, and there are other at, uh, this book symbols in art religion and culture by Farin Tchaikovsky I don't think so <laughs> that's uh -huh. my book so uh, just kidding right but, uh, but know, yeah, I've, so never, I've never um felt that my work was in any way religious or related to religion I mean I, I I'm I'm not a I'm not a spiritual person. I mean, it's it's all visual. My passion is for the visual world um, and how it meant many ways in which it manifests itself. I have an, an enormous appetite for the visual world. Um, and that's how I look at things that I see. Um, and I have been asked about that too. You know, doesn't this have symbolism? And um, I mean, there's a different kind of content in my later work. Um, which is actually political, but, and, and in a sense, the early work is political too. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was, it was, a, a, as a feminist, it, it, we were making, there were different kinds of feminist art. There was feminist art about the body and sexuality. And what I was doing and other women colleagues was more a kind of cultural feminism, looking at the culture of women. Now, you, you might say that most of this Islamic art was done by men, which is true, not the carpets. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, the, the, the truth is since ancient time, Mesopotamia, always man rules and till today, still man's rules, so nothing changed uh, in you know, Mesopotamian or Middle East area, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And then I, I know you mingle with politics a lot in your work since yeah. beginning till today. How you survived? Uh, you you have to maybe switch ahead in the slideshow. Oh, okay. <laughs> I okay. Have... This is a good one for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, around the turn of the century, uh, toward the end of the last century, I started working with cartography, uh, with mapping. And it's just, I've approached it in so many different ways over the years. It's just endlessly interesting because uh, not only does mapping describe the geography of places, it, 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 in it, the, the power relationships, who names the places, who owns the places as borders change. And all of this is in is sort of built into this mapping, which is more, you know, scientific and neutral, but not really. It's about who, who makes the maps and what are the maps used for. So um, someone told me I should look, I did a, a body of work in the late 90s based on um, uh, nautical charts and uh, my, a mapping of the seas and islands in the seas. I don't think I included them today, but then someone told me I should look at aeronautical charts. And I did, and I wrote away to a, an agency in Washington, NOAA, that produces uh, nautical charts of every place on earth. And they're used by pilots, both civilian and military pilots. They have to use them. They have all the information like no-fly zones and all kinds of things that they have to know about. But you can just order them. And they're beautiful, these maps. And so I ordered a bunch of uh, 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 aeronautical charts of parts of the world that the US had bombed. And um, it became this piece called Targets. Uh, for a long time, I was thinking about uh, aerial bombardment and, and how we don't see the victims more and more. This has changed in my lifetime um, and how abstract it's become and how pervasive it's become. And so I started doing research and I 
uh, made a list of all the countries we had bombed from 1945 to 2000. This piece was finished in 2000. And the piece is called Targets. And each wedge uh, is a different place on earth that experienced the same thing of, it, of uh, the, the bombardment of civilian populations. So you have to go back. Uh, and that's yes. what it looks like from the outside in my studio. I made it in Rome. I had a, a, a year's residency at the American Academy in Rome. And it was made by Italian a couple who were carpenters, who were woodworkers, wonderful. And it's made in sections and it fits together, can be put together in about three hours. It's like a kit. They screw together. And when you walk in, you're surrounded. Um, there is a door with another one that pushes in behind you. Um, and there are 24 sections and, and, and they're not continuous. The color is not continuous. I view them as each have, having had a separate experience. You can go on to the next one. Next slide. Yeah, so that's uh, inside. And, um, I, you know, you told me only to include a few slides, so I didn't include any more details. But if you go inside, three or even four people who can go inside and you talk, your voice is amplified. There's, a, there's an echo uh, because of the shape, which I had not anticipated, but it was like a gift. I really like it. Some people get scared and want to leave. Um, but it, it sort of resonates with the subject matter. And where is it today? In my studio. In your studio. It's traveled and around the world. It's crossed the ocean more times than I have. Oh, they goodness. like it in Europe much more than here. Why? Well, I think it's anti-American to them. Yeah. <laughs> So um, do you need permission for a work like this? No. And did you face any problem for like making something like this in terms of politics and, you know? No, you, no, no. I, I, I mean, it, it was a gift to be at the American Academy in Rome and I had a very big studio with a high ceiling and I was inspired by the Tempietto of Bramante down the hill uh, okay. with, with the dome and also the Pantheon with the light oh, coming wow. in from the top. So a lot of things kind of figured into the form of this. I, I'm not a sculptor. I only made two sculptures in my life and this is one of them. How long it took? I'm sure it's been... Well, you know, I, I guess I worked on it for about a year. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, acrylic, it's it. acrylic on canvas, which all my paintings are. Okay. And I just, uh, you like mapping a lot. And once you said we are trying to pattern the world by making map of it. Why mapping? Like this? Are this mapping based because you travel a lot? Well, uh, um, I, I don't want my work to be looked at as a kind of travelogue. I mean, I haven't been to many of the places in here. And more and more, I'm mapping places that I've never been to. In the beginning, I think it was inspired by travel, but I think less and less. The last series of paintings I did were based on American Civil War battles because uh, maps of uh, American Civil War battles, I don't think we have them in this talk, but maybe we do, I don't remember. <laughs> so this is targets in a larger exhibition in Venice in the Venetian Arsenale this, these were the paintings that I showed last summer, and um, their battles and their viral outbreaks coming out of the maps. That's the Battle of Shiloh, which was a very bloody Civil War battle. Um, if you move across, you can see some of the others. The Battle of Fredericksburg, uh, Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Battle of New Madrid. And, and all of the, these are map and you draw on a map. Um, I, I made large canvases, not so large. This is a smaller one. This is 34 by 42, copying the map, maps and painting them. This one is the Battle of Petersburg, Virginia. And in each of them, there are these viral outbreaks, which for me was like a kind of collapsing of the 19th century and the 21st century. This is the Battle of Chattanooga. Um, 
where we're having to meet is as we were going through the pandemic when I painted these in 2020 and 2021, um, we're also going through a resurgence of this, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, all the uh, problems that led to the civil war, which are still with us uh, and the polarization around it. So, you know, as you look at it, um, there's something decorative in all my work. It's my sensibility, even if the subject matter is pretty horrific. Uh, because that's in you. It's in me, and yeah. Your DNA and your blood. <laughs> yeah, that's the Battle of Bull Run, which was another, they were all very bloody battles. And now I'm trying to do some new work. Um, my work has been about war in one way or another since Targets, actually before Targets, uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville. Um, and I, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at our own history, but I'm trying to bring into the new ones some beauty again. I'm not, I don't want to paint any more viruses. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, I know you, one of your major work and most known, or I should say accessible by public are your large public art. Yes, project. I've done 18 public artworks. Wow. How and, did you gain that expertise? Okay, very public. simple. Uh, this was the first one I got. And I got a form in the mail asking to submit slides back in 1979. Um, and it was the first transit art project in America in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I submitted my slides, 10 slides and maybe uh, whatever. Um, and six months later, I got a letter that I was a finalist and I would almost forgotten about it. And what I, what I was asked to do was to make a, make a model, make a proposal. I think, I don't know how many artists were finalists, three or four probably. Um, and each artist had to make a model and a proposal and figure out a budget and, um, really kind of conceive of a project and uh, find a space in that station that you wanted to work with and um, and then present it. And you, I remember we presented it in a room uh, filled with people from the business community, the arts community, uh, the architects. And um, I was very nervous because I'd never done it before, but I presented my model, which was a miniature version of this. Um, and sometime later, I was told that I was chosen to do it. And um, there are different ways that people get projects, but this was how I got the first one. And uh, sometimes, like the last one that I did, which was for the GSA, the National General Services Administration, I was asked to, and this is the GSA's, no, this is the next to last one. This is the MTA in New York. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't put the GSA in here. Uh, that one, they ask if you're interested. And if you're interested, they keep Im your images on file and they have panels that review their projects and they don't get back to you unless you're chosen. And then you're not in competition if you've been chosen at that point and you're asked to do a proposal and a model. Um, so this one uh, is in New York at 86th Street and Central Park West in the subway station, uh, the C and B local line. So it's called Parkside Portals. And part of it is aerial views at that junction of Central Park West and Central Park and 86th Street. Um, some of it from Google Earth, which was the first time I used Google Earth, but I use it again. I've used it again and I'm really interested in it. Um, and some are aerial photography I found online and some are photographs of buildings I made walking around the neighborhood. So I, I like to call it from the, uh, I don't know, from looking way up in the sky down to this area, this intersection. Uh, the, I call it the microcosm and the macrocosm and then getting very up close to details of things as you walk in the street there. So this is the largest section. 
Um, and rather than making a kind of picture on the wall, I always want my work to feel like it's part of the architecture. So I made it coming up into where the arches were in the architecture. And when I proposed it, there were pipes there and they said, no, you can't do that. But then they, they took the pipes out. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I want you to feel, this is a, a shallow, you know, th this is one of the stations where there's just one line on each floor, one on a lower level, one on the upper le level. So you can't really get back. If you get back, that's yeah. where the train is. So you, you, you only get back, you walk off the train and you are facing this. And I want people to feel like they can enter that space as they walk off the train. Yeah. So uh, do you have, uh, did you have any difficulties for this? I, I know like, you know, these are not one person job artists to do and you need a lot of permission. There are a lot of difficulties. You need a lot of tools. Not really. No, no, not really. This, they're very now, I mean, you've seen there's art in all the stations and they're very professional, very experienced. They, you know, they have the program set up. Um, so, and, and I have worked with this. The, this is a combination of glass mosaic and ceramic tile. Um, I have worked with the same mosaicists um, in a small town in the Northern Friuli region of Italy since the 1980s. I worked with the parents and now I work with the son. So I am I, very comfortable in the way we translate my painting into uh, glass mosaics. And this, uh, you know, I always go there. This was the last time I went there before the pandemic um, and work out the details section by section with them. Um, so as, as we go through this, it shows the intersection, different seasons of the year. You have all four seasons and then you have the, the streets viewed from all four different angles. And then there's the the bird's eye view and then the the person street level view. Yeah. Wow, interesting. So these are all different subway station. No, it's city. all in the same station. 86. Oh, all in the same station. Yes. Yes. And then it's in six places in the 86th Street section. There are two as sections on on the uptown floor, two sections on the downtown floor. And now what you're looking at, there's a section above the stairwell on both sides, on the north and south ends, going from the upper platform to the lower platform. So that's the other one. All right, so very interesting. And you said you did 80 something public project installation. Yeah, and this one, um, you can see on the sides really blown up the kind of ornament that's on those buildings that are in the middle that you're looking down on. Um, a lot of, it's a, it's a section of the city where there are a lot of beautiful, uh, like late 19th century buildings. The, the ornament isn't as colorful as I made it. That's m my interpretation of it. So uh, you won a lot of awards and residency. How important those award and residency were in your life or overall for artists? Very important. Um, I, um, I did a lot of residencies. I can't anymore because the circumstances of my life are different, but I did them during years when I could. And um, every time I went to a residency, you get so much more work done and you're in a much more concentrated way. You don't have to do anything except turn up for dinner. I mean, your time is your own and it's just amazing how much more time you have. Um, and it's also a break from your, your life and you, you meet people, writers and other artists from other places. And uh, that's, that's a, a, an extra bonus of sitting at dinner and having these wide ranging conversations. But may, may, mainly it's the gift of time. And yes. I would encourage people to apply and to keep applying. I, I applied to the American Academy in Rome for 32 years before I got it, um, the Rome Prize. 
I didn't apply every year, but from the first time I applied till I finally got it was 32 years and it was worth it. Yeah. It, you know, and I like the longer residencies like that one, which was a year because you can really settle in and get work done. Um, and I, I need that kind of time. Well, I didn't put these in, but these are, yeah. <laughs> these are some things that are I on now. How your artwork became part of your everyday life. And yeah. Well, uh, I always have leftovers after the public art project. And in the beginning, I, I saved in my storage all these boxes of leftovers in case the artwork was damaged and I had to go back and restore it. Well, they never let you know. They never bring you back. Um, and the first one that we saw, uh, the Harvard Square piece is actually a ruin and it, has, it can't even be restored. It has to be replaced. Um, and that's another story. It's something I'm going through now. But um, this is made with all those strips around the outside are from an artwork that I, uh, I, I did in a, a library at the University of Minnesota in Mankato, Minnesota. Um, and, and the tiles were a little larger than the walls. So there, there were all these strips that remained. And in the center, those two tiles, I did a piece in the subway in Los Angeles about the history of the movies. And I had to take those out. They didn't want guns in it. Um, that's Betty Davis in the letter and Rambo. Smaller than life, I may say. Very interesting, very beautiful and very functional. I, yeah, well, we sit there every day, you know. Yeah, and uh, that's part of, I think. And that's my bathroom. And that this, this is leftovers from five or six different public art projects um, that are cut up. And, you know, how I did it, I was working with a friend of mine who is an architect, and he we, we redid the bathroom, which was you know, a loft bathroom, very crude um, at, at some point, and actually it was 1989. And I had these boxes of tiles and we mapped out on the floor of my studio, we taped out the shape of the walls and I opened all the boxes and played with them until I, I, I made something for the floor. Yeah. And the walls, the walls aren't shown here. That shows your creative mind, Joyce. Well, I don't know. Yeah. So, so, you know, people ask me if they can have some of these tiles for their bathrooms. And um, I gave some to a friend of mine in Los Angeles. I gave some to my sister-in-law, um, but they're pretty much used up now. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So this brought us to the end of our conversation. So overall, how satisfied you are now? How you feel about all these changes? And oh, what's your advice? for women artists at the end. Well, what are, what are you referring to? Um, I don't know about weird? all this work you've done, about the, like, you know, what you lead and where you are today, like that movement of pattern and the creative feminine art. Um, How do you feel we are? I, I don't know. I think all of us feminists are devastated by the end of Roe v. Wade and, and, and so many, um, and the guns and so much physical violence and the environment. And there are just so many things um, that we worked for and believed in and seemed to be happening. Um, and it, it's just kind of crushing. And, and in terms of art, um, I mean, I think we did make a difference and there's much art by women and, and much more diverse art, much more diverse women whose work we're seeing now and uh, both in terms of race and gender. And it's, it's just it's, in that way, it's a, it's a very exciting period, I think. Any advice for other women artists, Joyce, as our last? Oh, community. Community is everything. For me, it always was. I've, I'm, I'm kind of addicted to groups and now I'm addicted to social media, which is not such a great thing. But um, yeah, you, you need a community. And, and I am so lucky that I came of age at the moment I did with the surge of second wave feminism. And it was, it just could have buoyed us and carried us forward. And it, um, 
I mean, we're in a moment of backlash and retrenchment. It's, it's a tough moment for young women. And we have to stay together. You know, yes. we have to stay together in particular. That's what we do in, at National Association of Women Artists. And thank you for joining and thank you for sharing your life and your experience with us today. And overall, um, you know, I should say you fighting your whole life for us well, as women. With, with a whole lot of others, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of a large, large community and thank you and so many women have made such incredible contributions such incredible artwork yes exactly thank you very much we salute you joyce thank you i thank appreciate you. your time thank you bye